Welcome to a special episode of This Is My Architecture. I'm Todd, and today we're right outside of Boston in Somerville, and we have the special privilege of touring a chocolate factory at Taza Chocolate. Inspired by their Mexican roots, Taza products are stone ground and wrapped in vibrant colors that immediately give you a sense of rich culture. As I make my way through the factory's gift store, I'll need to get properly prepped before exploring more and meeting with the plant manager. On the way, I witness the full life cycle, from bags of cacao beans to the bars themselves, including all the hard work and smiles in between. Within the process, traditional Mexican stone mills are used with hand-carved stones that turn inside the heated mills, grinding the beans and drawing out the natural butter, all while preserving their bold flavors. Hi, are you Rich? Yes, I am. Rich, how you doing? I'm Todd from AWS. Todd, welcome to the Taza Chocolate Factory. I appreciate the invite. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of Taza and how this whole factory came to be? Sure. It was started in 2005 by our founders, Alex and Kathleen Whitmore, when they decided to bring Mexican stone ground chocolate back to Somerville, Mass. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what the process is? I heard a lot about bean to bar that Taz is really all about. What does that actually mean? Sure, we're a bean to bar chocolate manufacturer, so it means we bring in the actual cacao beans and we manufacture them to the end state, the chocolate bar. One of the things I noticed is many different machines when I walked in. Can you talk to me about the production and the scale of production that's actually happening outside of this factory? Just for us alone, this year we're on pace to produce 800,000 pounds of chocolate, which involves bringing 800,000 pounds of cacao beans through this building <laughs> sure, sure. to produce those bars or discs of product. Being a traditional chocolate maker, you know, there was a lot of um, legacy equipment and, and keeping track of that and how we're running was basically a lot of paperwork. So there are piles of paperwork. And that's one of the reasons we decided to partner with Tulip to help us digitize our shop floor. It was important for us to get better and operate more efficiently. We, we also want to look out for our employees and the easier their jobs can be by uh, reducing or eliminating downtime. That was a big benefit for us for partnering with Tulip. And I would assume this type of technology that Taza has implemented within the factory really allows you to come to market with new products or new features and ideas even quicker than before. It does. It's really um, cut down our product development R&D window and it's helped us to create some great new products that we're soon to come out to the market with. Tulip and Taza are so close from a partner perspective that all I have to do is hop up a few flights of stairs and I'm there. The offices at Tulip are full of developers and innovators that make up a friendly environment where software tools are created to make process engineering easier. Hi, I'm John from Tulip. John, pleasure to meet you. It's nice to meet you. How did Tulip really get started? Where are the roots from? Right, so Tulip was founded by engineers out of MIT's Media Lab in 2014, and we're based here in Somerville, Massachusetts. So is Tulip really all about IoT, or are there other things that you guys do? So IoT is definitely a part of it, but it's fundamentally about digitizing manufacturing processes. So there are other use cases as well, such as machine monitoring, um, digitizing paper workflows, um, and also, as you saw with Taza, integrating IoT technologies with legacy machines. Digitizing a company, that's a huge monumental undertaking, but it sounds like you guys make that easy. That's what we try to do. So what do you say we go take a look at some of the tech? Inside Tulip's lab, I find a number of workstations that are used to demo solutions and prototypes leveraging technologies such as breaker beam sensors and computer vision integration for smart manufacturing. Tulip strives to not only learn, but implement leading edge technology that makes everyday work more enjoyable. They do this through augmenting machines with sensors, connectivity, and near real time insight that empowers their customers to better understand and manage their operations. John, after seeing everything on the Taza factory floor and all the machinery that's now connected, can you talk to us a little bit more about how Tulip customers are leveraging Tulip IoT? Yeah, sure. So for our customers that do have IoT workflows, devices integrate with our hardware device here. Devices pass outputs through the cloud through an encrypted authenticated WebSocket up to the Tulip instance running in the cloud, a Kubernetes worker, essentially. And then device outputs flow back through the cloud back to the device. For our customers that are using digital transformation workflows, you know, it might be an operator interacting with a touchscreen device. And that device, in the same way, sends events through the cloud up to our Kubernetes service. Which means not every customer needs to be connected via the gateway itself in order to communicate back with Tulip's environment and have all the events being ingested and shown on a dashboard on their end. That's exactly right, yeah. We continue to discuss how legacy equipment can be retrofitted with IoT sensors in order to collect telemetry data and stream it back to the AWS cloud. To check out Tulip's IoT sensors and gateways in action, I'll head on downstairs.
So, Todd, this is my colleague, Gio. Gio, pleasure to meet you. Very nice to meet you, Todd. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do here at Tulip? Yeah, so I'm a customer success engineer here at Tulip, and I help our customers deploy Tulip down on the shop floor. So we're on the shop floor, and it looks like we're surrounded by some legacy industrial equipment. Can you tell us about what's going on here? Yes, absolutely. So this piece of equipment is called a winnower, and what it does is it takes the roasted chocolate bean and it splits the shell from the actual bean that then gets used to manufacture the chocolate. I also see a little sensor that's sitting up here. What exactly is going on there? Yeah, so what that sensor is doing is it's measuring the uptime of the machine. So every time the, fat, the, the crank arm for the pan, so the pan passes in front of it, we're able to get information on the state of the machine that we use in Tula. Right, and so that sensor is connected to our IoT gateway on the wall. So every time the sensor emits an event, we take that event and send it to the cloud. So you guys are essentially monitoring the machinery's uptime as well as the revolutions that that sensor is tracking. Are there any other types of events that you're tracking? Yes, absolutely. So back there on the gateway, we actually also measure the ambient conditions. So by measuring the temperature and humidity, we're actually able to monitor the conditions in the room, and then Taz is able to use that information to make more informed decisions to make quality products. With a pocket full of service icons, it's time to find a quiet corner and dive into the architecture that drives Tulip's platform. John, we're here right outside the roasting room talking a little bit of architecture. So I went ahead and I threw up some icons for us so we can deep dive here. Great, so to begin with, uh, Tulip is a multi-tenant SaaS product. So all the services and code we write are Dockerized. And we use Kubernetes as our Docker orchestration tool. So these are all Kubernetes workers that are communicating with each other in cluster. And so the Kubernetes nodes are EC2 instances that are deployed across multiple availability zones for high availability. How exactly does the traffic get in through this, what looks like to be a front door here with a network load balancer? Right, so this is our EC2 network load balancer and all requests, whether they come from IoT devices or user browser applications, go through the NLB. Then from there, they're handed off to the appropriate Kubernetes service ingress. It's the ingress's job to determine what backend service exactly should process the request. Um, if the destination service is a single tenant service, then all the information needed to process that request is already in the context. If it's destined for a multi-tenant service, one that's shared across different factories, then um, the ingress service will inject a value so that the multi-tenant service understands what factory the request belongs to. Okay, so the master nodes that we have following the recommended three multi-availability zones that are, are configured that way in order to avoid that split brain functionality when it comes to leader node selection amongst the masters. Tell me a little bit about the isolation that's happening within the namespaces themselves. Sure, so to begin with, um, all instances, all customers get their own instance, which we call a factory. So every factory has a unique domain name. And all factories also have a, its own Kubernetes namespace here. So a customer will get its own namespace, which has its various secrets and configuration there, and also its single tenant services live there. Um, in term, and other factory services make use of multi-tenant services, which live in the default Kubernetes namespace. It looks like you have multiple types of data stores that are supporting this architecture, such as the relational database service and a non-relational database service. So maybe talk about those and the underlying engine. Sure, so we run Postgres RDS instances um, in multi-AZ configuration for high availability. And this database stores a lot of what we call the completion data. So when people run Tulip applications, it generates output data, and this output data typically goes into Postgres. And then you can use Tulip to create visualizations and analytics on, based on that data. In addition, all the application definition and metadata is contained within MongoDB. So we have a replica set, and every factory instance has its own database within the replica set. And communication between Mongo and the worker nodes is done through VPC peering, so here. So although it looks like the EC2 nodes are talking across some VPC boundary, in reality, they're making use of like low latency inner VPC network traffic. And because it's VPC peering, all access is through private IP addresses. There's nothing exposed through public IPs. Okay, and you mentioned a little bit about metrics and alerting. What exactly is happening <clears throat> underneath the hood? Right, so when you run a multi-tenant SaaS product, like alerts and monitoring are critical. So we run within the Kubernetes cluster something called Prometheus, which scrapes pods for metrics data and stores them. We also run Grafana, which is a visualization and dashboard tool on top of Prometheus. In addition, we run a tool called Clustermon, also on top of Prometheus. With Clustermon, you can monitor critical metrics and take actions if they 
reach some threshold value. So a good example is if a pod is restarted frequently, um, cluster mom can say, you know, this has restarted three times in the past hour. It's time to page someone or something. Um, we also use AWS hosted Elasticsearch for log aggregation and analysis. And in addition, we run a service called Elastalert, which is much like Clustermon for log messages. It's a way to define rules and say, if I have seen this log message before, like maybe five times in an hour, it's time to like send a Slack message to warn things. Tell us a little bit about S3. I see this bucket sitting on the, on the outside yeah, of the sure. VPC. What's happening there? So like part of um, provisioning factory instances for customers is that every f customer gets their own IAM credentials. So customers use S3 to store certain files like PDFs, videos, um, images. And so within S3 are certain buckets and locations where only those IAM credentials are privileged to access. So when a factory goes either to upload or download material from S3, it uses those IAM credentials. If a different factory process tried to access the same location with its separate credentials, it would be unauthorized. Great, and it looks like private subnets here for all the availability zones. Yep. We have complete isolation of the customers via namespaces, IAM credentials, and things being stored on Amazon S3. So all of that wrapped into place here. It looks like we have a, a, a very cool type of architecture. Great, thank you. One more thing to address is how Tulip scales and goes from beyond just one customer to many. Can you talk to us a little bit about how Tulip will scale out in the future? Yeah, sure, Todd. So as you recall from before, Right now, Tulip runs a mix of single-tenant and multi-tenant services in our Kubernetes cluster. We think that going forward, a focus on multi-tenant services will help us scale up in the future. So how exactly will Tulip do that, leveraging multi-tenant services? Is there some type of uh, default namespace in order to create the shared services for all of your tenants? Right, so since multi-tenant services have to communicate with multiple different factories running for different customers, they'll all run in the default Kubernetes namespace. OK, great. And what I believe is multiple customers, multiple factories, also comes a, a footprint as well, a global footprint, if you will. Talk to us a little bit about how Tulip ex expects to expand with that global footprint. Uh, sure. So we plan on deploying to multiple different AWS regions. We work with manufacturers who have predictable production schedules, and we have to respect that. So by deploying to regions that coincide with their locations, we hope to be able to better support them. Perfect, perfect. And as they go along the lines of growing themselves, Tulip has to expect that a heightened level of ingestion, a higher volume, more events are coming in. What's the plan there to handle that? Right, so as you recall from Taza downstairs, all of the Taza machine monitoring events flows through our IoT gateway into the cloud, where they're processed in real time by a Kubernetes service. And we want to expand on this capability to be able to ingest many more events and provide better analytical tools out of the box for customers. Right now, whereas all the events are processed by an individual factory, we think that we can have a shared ingester service where all events will be dedicated, and then other backend services will then, at their leisure, read the events from the service. Right now, we're just beginning a project called Apps at Edge. The idea being that, whereas today, all the events flow from the gateway into the cloud where they're processed immediately, um, perhaps we could move some of the processing closer to the client at the edge, and therefore be able to scale better. And in doing so, you're able to decrease the latency from the actual on the floor of all of your different customers into Tulip's environment. Right, we think that the client will experience a decrease in latency and improvement in application response times. In typical small business fashion, Tasa Chocolate operated in batch style, where resources performed manual tasks in order to create their end product. However, Tulip was able to make the human to machine interaction easier and more efficient by replacing paper processes with digital automation through their IoT connected platform. And there you have it, another customer making leaps by leveraging the cloud. Thanks for joining me on this special episode of This Is My Architecture. I'll see you soon.